So it's my pleasure to welcome you also on behalf of the Center for Israel Studies. Um, we will have a discussion about the legacy of Shimon Peres, and I think we really made clear it's not a memorial. We want to, um, we have invited scholars, we invited people who were close to him, we invited people who shared part of the road, going part of the road to Shimon Peres. Um, but I think what is important in our discussion is also to be open and maybe, if necessary, to be critical. So I'm very much looking forward to our discussion with three experts um, I would like to introduce to you. Daniel Kurtzer, who's in the middle, has a career of 30 years in the US Foreign Service. He was United States Ambassador to Israel under President Clinton. He was United States Ambassador to Egypt under President Bush. In 2007, which I found remarkable, yeah. it was the opposite, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, what I found remarkable is that in 2007, he was uh, named the first commissioner of Israel's baseball team, is that correct? <laughs> uh, that's maybe the, the secret reason we might have been here. <laughs> find out about Paris and baseball. Uh, he now holds the S. Daniel Abram Chair of <coughs> Middle East Policy Studies at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. And among the many books he has authored and co-authored and edited, uh, I just mentioned The Peace Puzzle, America's Quest for Israel and Arab-Israeli Peace, 1989 to 2011. To my left, is Shlomo ben -Ami, who was born in Morocco and emigrated to Israel with his family at the age of 12. He became professor of history at Tel Aviv University and published several books on modern Spanish history. That is actual field you know, as a historian. You can go out and become a politician in other areas. But first, he became ambassador of Israel to Spain, very fittingly, in 1987. Uh, in 19, in a few years later, he was elected to the Knesset, and in 2000, he was appointed foreign minister by then Prime Minister Ehud Barak of the Labour Party. Justice Daniel Kurtzer, Shlomo ben, Shlomo ben Ami's career, was very much connected with the high hopes in the Israeli Arab peace process, and he himself was very closely um, connected and associated with the Taba summit of 2001, maybe the, the last real window of peace we have seen in the last decades. The book of reflections on the conflict called Scars of War, Wounds of Peace, and he serves as Vice President of the Toledo International Center for Peace and is involved in the, by now successful, peaceful resolution um, of many conflicts, and I'm referring to the one in Colombia, where he was very much involved. To the very left, Guy Ziv, who is Assistant Professor of International Studies here at American University. He has written many articles on nuclear policy in Israel, U.S.-Israeli relations, Israel strategic partnership with France, um, and he also has written extensively on the role of leading personalities in foreign policy change. Um, Dr. Ziv uh, is also the author of a book on Shimon Peres which is called Why Hawks Become Doves. And uh, I should also mention he has worked a lot on um, the US Department of State on Capitol Hill and for leading nonprofit organizations that promote American involvement in Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking. So it's a pleasure to welcome you on this panel. And I think everyone would start with a short statement about Shimon Peres, his involvement in the peace process, and maybe a little bit also about your personal relation, if you want to allude to that. Good afternoon. I want to thank uh, the Dean, Professor Brenner, for organizing this at uh, American University. Uh, I will tell you that uh, once a year, when I served as ambassador, uh, I would uh, attend a uh, session at the Paris Center for Peace in which they were playing baseball. Uh, Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs uh, were convened to play ball. And so I took the occasion after one of those sessions to uh, try to talk to Shimon Peres about it. And uh, 
It was uh, the visit to Israel of a New York Giants football player, Tiki Barber, who showed up at Perez's office, having met Perez at a restaurant in New York, and Perez begins grilling him about baseball, which for Tiki Barber was a little bit unusual. So uh, the uh, Renaissance man that Shimon Perez was kind of missed on that issue. Uh, a little more seriously, uh, I want to take a very quick look at uh, uh, some of the dichotomies uh, and, uh, in some ways, contradictions that marked uh, Mr. Perez's life. Uh, I'm a uh, subscriber to the great person theory of history uh, that is important as uh, international, regional, and local events are. It's individuals who move uh, the uh, 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 source of history forward. Uh, and in this respect, uh, Shimon Peres becomes a very difficult case study because he was in the eye of history for nearly 70 years, uh, during which time uh, he marked some great uh, mo moments in Israeli uh, diplomatic history, uh, and in other times marked moments which uh, still uh, are subject to a significant debate. There are those, and I think Professor Ziv will probably uh, talk to you about this. I'm, I'm not trying to anticipate his remarks. He's written a very good book on uh, From Hawk to Dove. Um, Professor Yael Aronoff, who's out at Michigan State, has talked about attributes of leadership of Shimon Peres. I like to think of Shimon Peres as both a tribalist and a universalist. Uh, after all, uh, you look at the beginning of this man's public career as a close but very young confidant of David Ben-Gurion, uh, in which uh, he was uh, definitely one of the founders of Israel, having committed himself uh, as Director General of Israel's Defense Ministry to building up the infrastructure of uh, Israel's military industry, uh, helping to forge the relationship, helping to forge the relationship with France that provided Israel with the military wherewithal that ultimately would prove uh, to be Israel's success in the 1967 war to build a relationship that ultimately allowed Israel to become at least uh, a so-called nuclear weapons power in the uh, Middle East. Uh, and uh, at the same time uh, was a, uh, a proponent uh, over the years, especially after 1967, of settlements, of uh, building up uh, the areas that Israel had occupied in the 1967 war. There's no question that if one tried to assign a label or a title to Paris during these years, it would be, at least one of those would be tribalist, a Zionist uh, dedicated to advancing the cause of Jewish nationalism and Jewish self-determination. Uh, in some respects, much more a proponent of a view of Zionism uh, espoused by Jabotinsky than of a view of Zionism espoused by Martin Buber, uh, but a man who dedicated his uh, life during these years to creating a safe and strong and vibrant state of Israel. What marks the shift in Shimon Peres, whether it's from Hawk to Dove or from Dimona to Oslo, as Yael Aronoff suggests, is uh, his realization in the 70s, perhaps, or even 80s, that the world in which Israel existed had changed, and that even though it still required Israel to be vigilant and strong and safe and secure, uh, the idea that Israel was up against an immutable force of Arab opposition may no longer exist, or might not, have lo might not longer have existed at that point. And so Perez turned to what I would call the universalist side of his personality as manifest not only in his uh, dedication to the cause of peace for the remainder of his life, but also to uh, grand ideas for rethinking Israel's place in the Middle East, uh, the new Middle East that Perez espoused for these many years, or the ideas of science. Uh, Perez loved to talk about the newest uh, advances in science, nanotechnology, and uh, water technology. Uh, all of these things represented Perez's view of a strong Israel, in other words, the tribal side of his personality, that could build with its neighbors a different kind of Middle East. 
Now, we know that Paris was also famous for wit. You heard some of it in the, the clip. Um, Aronoff, in, in her book on the psychology of Israeli prime ministers, says that there are three at least three characteristics that distinguish uh, those who have succeeded from those who have not yet succeeded. One is an orientation toward the future rather than the past. A second is what she calls cognitive flexibility. And a third is an openness to the influence of key advisors. It's almost a textbook case of the way Shimon Peres conducted his life. Uh, talking about the past and future, you heard some of his quips in the clip. Uh, he said, I think to deal with the past is a waste of time. You can't change it anyway. Or better to dream than to remember. Or the past doesn't need the future, and the future doesn't need the past. This was a man, however, who studied history. He was an avid reader. Um, his uh, associates and aides would ply him with materials every day uh, in order to keep him up to date on uh, changing developments in the world. And so this idea that he portrayed that the past wasn't important was really an a, a artificial way of describing the idea that you use the past, in his view, to build a different future. Or the idea of cognitive flexibility. Paris said, the way to peace is not war and not negotiations, it's innovation. I've spent my entire life as a dreamer. I choose to be an optimist. Uh, dreamers and optimists are often decried as being unrealistic, but Perez was actually a realist, understood quite well that it was only a strong Israel, and an Israel that maintained its uh, strength and its military and economic and political power was an Israel uh, that could uh, bring about or help bring about a peace with neighbors. In that same respect, and uh, just one digression into our own political situation. One of the uh, constant features of Paris's comments about international and world affairs was the idea that for him, a strong United States was an essential requirement for a strong Israel. And what he meant by that was not simply a United States that dedicated itself to military power. It was the United States in which our national character uh, the definition of who we are and how we were conveyed that idea to the rest of the world was as important to Paris as the military and economic power that we were able to bring to bear. So you analyze Paris through uh, these very different uh, uh, ways of analysis, almost like uh, the, the, the jeweler who looks at a diamond and has to look at various facets in order to understand all of its parts and perhaps never fully gets a grasp on the entirety of what's being analyzed. You'll hear today the three of us look at this man from very different perspectives and prisms. Uh, some of us had the opportunity, the privilege, to have spent uh, what we call quality time with him, uh, quality time that always required a good glass of Israeli wine in order to loosen up the conversation. Uh, and the wine was served because somewhere in the world it was 5 o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> even if our meeting was at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but the meetings were fascinating uh, because you did your business. You conducted whatever it was that you needed to get done. But what you really were dealing with was a man who was larger than whatever position he occupied, whether it was president at the end of his public career or prime minister or defense minister or foreign, foreign minister, uh, he always spoke and addressed issues beyond the ken of his particular uh, portfolio. And so I will remember Shimon Peres as uh, a man dedicated uh, both to the, um, the good of Israel, the survival, security, well-being of the state of Israel, but also one who understood that Israel could be, as he was wont to say, a beacon uh, for a better Middle East in which Israel and its neighbors could live together in peace and security. Thank you. If uh, you allow me, I will seize uh, upon one remark, uh, one comment that uh, Dan made about uh, uh, Shimon Peres ve being very keen on uh, American strength, because this would, of course, affect Israel's uh, 
situation, international conditions. Uh, there is this anecdote about uh, Levi Eshkol. Levi Eshkol was uh, the prime minister in the 1960s, very well known for his sense of humor. And uh, there is one aide that comes to him and says, Prime Minister, there is a terrible drought. And uh, the Prime Minister asks, where? And they say, and he, and he tells him, in the Negev. He says, ah, thanks God, I thought in the United States. Uh, so, <laughs> so we could live with a weaker Israel so long as we have a stronger U.S. Uh, but the second one is a rather personal anecdote that will try and bring me into what I want to say about, the, about Shimon Peres. I might have been close to 13 year old, and I lived in a kibbutz uh, uh, on the shores of the Lake of Galilee, and uh, Shimon Peres was then uh, a member of kibbutz Alumot on the mountains surrounding the valley. And there was a, an original am amphitheater in Tzemach, a place called Tzemach that we used to come for shows, and, uh, and there was one of, the, of those moments, and this was the 19th, 50s, 1956, before the Sinai campaign, and Shimon Peres came to that show accompanied by Guy Mollet, the then was Prime Minister of France. And uh, at the time I used to uh, collect autographs, so I ran to Guy Mollet because of my background in a French school, so I was very sensitive to a French Prime Minister visiting Israel. I asked uh, uh, Guy Mollet for an autograph, I got it, and I started to run away, and Shimon Peres took him by my hand, you don't, you don't want my autograph? I said, no, I'm not interested, because I didn't have any clear idea who was Shimon Peres, but a far clearer idea as to who was uh, uh, Guy Mollet. And that particular moment expresses a lot uh, Shimon Peres' um, uh, definition as a, as a statesman, as a politician, uh, at that particular moment. First, he was the one that was present and uh, 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 highly instrumental in creating the alliance with France. Shimon Peres was at every strategic crossroads in Israel's uh, history. So the alliance with France was practically his own doing. Uh, at the time, there were no particular uh, relations with the United States in terms of arms supplies, strategic support, etc. And there was always a debate in Israel between an American uh, um, uh, direction or, 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 an Israel, or a France one. There was even a Russian, if you want to know. But at the time, Shimon Peres led that uh, course of strategic thinking in Israel's policy making. And that was extremely important to win the 1967 war. Then that moment is also linked with the supposed nuclear capabilities of Israel, because the French gave Israel the first nuclear reactor. And Shimon Peres was in the middle of that momentous strategic debate in Israel. My interpretation, you do not have to share it, the other members of the panel, is the following. The nuclearist, Shimon Peres at the head of them, were at the time doves, not hawks. They were so pessimistic of the possibility of ever reaching a peace agreement with the Arab world that they believed that the nuclear option or the supposed nuclear option would prevent a war but not bring us to peace necessarily. They didn't want to occupy land. They didn't believe in occupying land as a negotiating tool with the Arabs for peace because they did not believe in peace. In 1967, for example, when Israel's army was deployed ready for war because Abdel Nasser has introduced his army into the Sinai Peninsula, Shimon Peres was not in the government, but he came to Dayan, who was then defense minister, and he proposed a certain proposal. This is how he writes it in his book, in one of his memoirs. The certain proposal had to do with the nuclear question, 
as a way to prevent the 1967 war. They were not interested in war. Among other reasons, as I insist, was that they were very pessimistic. And that was the pessimism of Ben-Gurion, that it is useless to have land, because anyway, they won't serve as a bargaining uh, tool in negotiations with the Arab world. So he was nuclearist because he didn't believe in territories, in land. That was also the position of Ben-Gurion. So that was a second thing that I interpret for that, from that moment in my childhood. He was French-oriented. He was a nuclearist because what I tried to interpret. And the third thing, I am not sure, frankly, that I would define Perez in terms of dove or hawk. I think he was what in Israel they used to call and still call a bitchonist. He was a security guy until his very last moment. He was an, a man of the inner circle of the bitchonist in Israel, of the security guys. He served at the Ministry of Defense. He was the aide of David Ben-Gurion. And he was not particularly generous towards the Arab side in terms of giving away assets, etc. He, he was a man of peace at the end, but he was not a peacenik. He was not a guy of, <clears throat> of flowers and uh, like, like the others. <clears throat> it was the younger generation that went to peace with this uh, idealistic vision of the world. I don't think that Paris was ever there. And it was also something which was very um, characteristic of the political party that at the time controlled the destinies of the country, Mapai. In Mapai, there was not much of an ideology, but there was a lot of execution of doing things. Shimon Peres was a doer. He was probably a very unique combination of a vision man that wake up in, wakes up in the morning and goes about executing the dream. So he had this combination. He was a dreamer, but also a good executive. This is why Ben-Gurion appointed him to that position of the number two of the Ministry of Defense. And they were also, I'm using here terms to which I give my own interpretation. It's up to you if you accept that or not. They were all Leninist of, a so of sorts. What do I mean by Leninist? Not that they were communists, they were not communists. Lenin had one single idea, the revolution. And he will do everything to safeguard the revolution. The one single idea of this generation was the creation of the state of Israel and consolidating the state of Israel. If this requires war, so it be. If it requires peace, so it will be peace. If it requires reconciling with Germany, so we will reconcile with Germany because we have one, one single idea, and that is creating the state and consolidating it. And that was what distinguished them from Herut, from Begin. They were doers. The others had, according to them, the ideas, you know, lofty ideas about grand uh, Eretz Israel, etc. But they didn't settle the land. They didn't create assets. They, 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 they didn't develop the country. It was Mapai. He, Shimon Peres, belonged to that uh, stream of thought and, uh, and uh, of politics. So another thing that... Uh, uh, is very characteristic, I think, of um, his career, of the ups and downs. You know, I, I remember frequently when I had this contact with Arafat, I would ask him, Mr. Arafat, you need to do this, you need to do that. Uh, you are a major statesman, you, are, uh, you need to take decisions, etc. He would say, no, 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 I am not a statesman. I am a general but I am also a politician. He would put always an emphasis that he is a politician. And I think that historians and biographers of Shimon Peres in years to come will have 
to see, to analyze this person, uh, where did he strike the balance between his persona as a politician and his persona as a statesman? Of course, you cannot do statesmanship without being a politician. If you do not accumulate political power, you can write poetry, but you cannot make peace or war or anything else. So in that sense, Shimon Peres was in great part a politician. I still uh, wonder why in 1974 he outflanked Rabin from the right, and in 1994 is outflanked him from the left. There was something of politics about it, not only statesmanship. In 1974, 75, he becomes the father of the of Gush Emunim, of the block of the of the of the, play, uh, of the faithful. It was in part the Bitchonism that I mentioned that we need to cater to the idea of settlements. Igal Alon, for example, voted against the Camp David Agreement. Although he was a man of peace, far more a man of peace than Begin, but he couldn't bear the idea of dismantling settlements. That was the, 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 the constituent ethos of, of Zionism. So maybe that was one of the reasons. But there was another reason, and that is to challenge the prime minister. And he challenged the prime minister in 1993 with the Oslo Accord, and I fully agree with, uh, with Dan that the conditions obviously internationally changed, and he started to see the, 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 the consolidation of the state of Israel passing through some kind of reconciliation with, uh, um, with, the Arab, uh, with the Arab world. Shimon Peres was not, friend, was not friends of the idea of a Palestinian state. He came to it very late, and I'm not sure that he was convinced even at, at the end. Shimon Peres believed not in splitting the land. He believed in splitting the functions. He believed in a condominium, in an Israeli Jordanian condominium in Eretz Israel, in, 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 in the occupied territories. I was born in a town, in a city of uh, spies and, uh, and uh, the beat generation in Tangier. And he would come to me from time to time and ask me, how the hell was that city run? Because it was an international city. He had this idea of uh, how do you run uh, in, 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 uh, together with, jo with the Jordanians, how do you run the territories? In 1997, three, four years after the Oslo Accords, I was then the head of uh, the Labor Party Committee for Foreign Affairs. And I put for the first time in the history of labor the idea of endorsing the Palestinian state by the Labor Party. Until then, it was not the official policy of labor. And Shimon was against it. Because then he still thought in terms of a Jordanian option of sorts. The idea of giving back the land to the 1967 borders was always extremely difficult to him. And when I came back from Camp David, and not Camp David, in fact, when I came back from the White House with the Clinton peace parameters, he told me personally when we visited Arafat in Gaza, on our way back, he told me, you have gone too far. So he was, there was a dichotomy about Shimon Peres, that he was a man of peace, and his disappearance for the, from the political scene in Israel is a major tragedy, if only because we remain with the discourse of fatalism and pessimism and uh, the sense of impasse. He did believe that this can be broken. But as, you, as to his uh, actual, you know, concrete positions on the peace accord, that was slightly more uh, uh, um, complicated. He 
he had the capacity that no other Israeli politician had. Whatever position he would get, would it be the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or uh, 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 um, an empty position such as Minister for Regional Cooperation, he will turn it into a leverage for doing bigger things. There was nobody like him in that capacity to turn whatever position he got into something that the guy that wanted to humiliate him by giving him that position would be stunned because suddenly he will come from, from, from nowhere with a major idea that will change reality. So that was an, uh, uh, an extraordinary capacity that Shimon no doubt uh, had. But he also has been known in Israeli electoral politics as a loser. He will not win elections. And again, this has to do, this has to do obviously with the fact that he was no demagogue, that he was no public manipulator. In politics, in daily politics, he might have been much more adept at maneuvering, but not in the discourse, in the dialogue with, uh, with the masses, with the public. There, you could see his weakness. He will lose his temper. He will uh, confront the public, something like deplorables, <laughs> and uh, which is the, the kind of things that you are not allowed to say in a campaign. But, but, and he would say it, because he couldn't resist the critique coming from, uh, from this mass of people that did not concur with his views. In his entire 70-year political career, he was active when Truman was here president. He was only two years and eight months prime minister. It's a major tragedy when you think of it, for him, for his political career. But his two-year premier premiership in the national unity government was outstanding by any standard. He probably was the best prime minister Israel had in, in such a difficult and short period. He defeated inflation. We had a South American inflation at the time. And he brought back the bulk of the army from Lebanon and created the conditions for a, for a future uh, last withdrawal from, um, uh, from, um, from Lebanon. One more last remark. The new Middle East. The was in Shimon Peres again, this struggle between the doer and the, and the man of vision. A new Middle East after the Oslo Accord, I'm sure that somewhere he knew that this is not practical, that this cannot work. A small confession. He proposed to me to write the book with him. We were very close at the time. And I had my reservations. And then eventually Naor wrote it. Because I thought that the Arab world would not accept modernization with Israel being the agent of, the, of, of that modernization. They, they might not mind to be modernized, but not through Israel. So there was this thing that has disappeared in our life today because there is no vision and they, there is, a, there is a, a, a passage in the Bible that says without a vision the, na the nation becomes wild, uncontrolled and I think this is the major thing that we lost. It is impossible to understand Israel's history without uh, the presence of Shimon Peres in all of these vital crossroads in our history. And today, we do not have any more. It's not only that he is one of the founding fathers or close to the founding fathers that uh, uh, seals the end of this discourse in Israeli life. It is the fact that we don't even young, have younger politicians that can convey that kind of uh, always be optimistic, always believe that things can be done, always look at the future, as he says in this, uh, uh, in this, um, 
uh, speech, although as a historian, you know, I uh, am very fond of the past. Thank you very much. So, uh, everybody hearing me? My microphone working? Great. Uh, I didn't have a chance to have wine with uh, Shimon Perez, and he didn't offer to co-write a book, so I don't, uh, it's an honor to follow the uh, ambassador and uh, foreign minister here. But I did have a chance to uh, sit down with him on uh, several occasions and interview him and interview dozens of people who uh, knew him very well, uh, journalists and former aides, as I was writing my dissertation that I, let her, uh, that I later uh, turned into a book. And concluded that there were really, uh, when, I, when I was thinking, you know, what can I say about his legacy, there are really three major points I want to uh, get across today. The first is that uh, his major contribution to Israel is in the realm of security, which I think was uh, said here earlier. Uh, secondly, he was Israel's foremost champion of peacemaking. He was indeed the hawk who later on became a dove. And third, despite his repeated failure in elections, he nevertheless exerted outsized influence on the Israeli political landscape, which is exactly what uh, 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 Professor Ben-Ami uh, just concluded as well. Uh, with respect to uh, the first point, his contributions to Israel's security. During the first half of his career, Perez was essentially preparing for war, not for peace. And he was tasked with the difficult, uh, undaunting task, really, of putting together a, an alliance with a major power that could help Israel defend itself and that could help Israel uh, counterbalance its greatest enemy, Egypt, and the other uh, neighbors that it surrounded itself with. So Ben-Gurion, who was his mentor, his boss, tasked him with that responsibility. And within two decades, the first two decades of Israel's existence, Perez had established the Israel aircraft industries. He forged a secret alliance with France, which enabled Israel to procure major uh, major arms from, uh, from the French. He negotiated an important arms deal uh, with Germany as well. And of course, he also uh, helped to build the Demona nuclear reactor, which gave Israel nuclear weapons and not just uh, conventional weapons. So uh, he was able to, uh, with the help of others, but really his own initiative, was able to help to transform Israel from a weak and isolated country into a uh, strong state that was able to defeat its enemies in both the 1956 and the 1967 wars, and of course provide Israel with the ultimate deterrent, which was uh, the Dimona nuclear reactor. And it was only during the second half of his career that Perez began to actively pursue peace, which he really viewed all along as two sides of the same coin, security and peace. And he, uh, for many years, had advocated the idea of a Jordanian option. It was something that he never quite abandoned altogether. But he later on came to the conclusion that Israel probably had no choice but to deal with the PLO's Yasser Arafat. And he, of course, became famous and a Nobel Prize recipient for his work on the, uh, on the Oslo Accords. The um, second point, which is the, uh, the uh, idea of Paris, the, the the peacemaker, the idea of Perez the Hawk, who became a dove. Perez is really a, a, a paradigmatic example uh, of a Hawk who became a dove. This is a fairly recent phenomenon in Israel in the last couple decades. We've seen uh, one leader after another who has modified his or her uh, positions on the, on the, on the uh, fundamental issue of a Palestinian uh, state or relations with the Palestinians. Rabin, Perez, Sharon, Olmert, Livni, and others all uh, went through this dovish turn over the years. But Perez did so a little earlier than the others, and it was more significant, uh, in, my, in my opinion. He wa and uh, uh, he wasn't just an ordinary policymaker, too. So we're talking about somebody who had a very discernible impact on Israeli uh, domestic uh, and foreign affairs. Up until the late 70s, he was very much a hawk. Not a hawk in the right wing, uh, territorialist uh, idea, as his counterparts in Likud, for example, or Heirut, the predecessor to Likud, were advocating, but very much somebody who, from uh, the early 50s until 1967, supported 
uh, very strong counterterrorism operations uh, against Israel's uh, adversaries. He displayed a very hostile attitude towards, Israel, towards Arab leaders. And he dismissed any kind of talk or of peace or compromise uh, with the Arab world. And it was after the Six-Day War, the 1967 war, when his Labor Party began supporting territorial compromise uh, that he, for example, he and Moshe Dayan spoke of that functional arrangement that uh, Professor Ben Ami mentioned. Uh, he still opposed Palestinian statehood. He still uh, opposed any kind of talks with the PLO, but he did begin to um, uh, consider the idea of territorial compromise. The, um, we know that he was uh, essentially the person, the point person in France in the 1950s. Uh, he helped, uh, as I said, uh, forge a secret arms deal with the French, uh, both conventionally and unconventionally. Uh, the, um, the last uh, point I wanted to make concerns uh, his, um, his uh, transformation at the end uh, from a hawk to a dove. Sorry, second to last point I want to make is his uh, transformation from a hawk to a dove. It was in the late, late 70s and early 80s that several events took place, one of which was he became the leader of the Labor Party. He had replaced Rabin as leader of the Labor Party. And when he lost the first election in 1977 to Menachem Begin, he became the leader of the opposition. So it wasn't just the leader of the Labor Party. It was the leader of the opposition. And then he began to adopt uh, more uh, moderate, more pragmatic, some would say more left-wing ideas, including uh, the idea of uh, territorial compromise, which he then fully embraced. And after Sadat's vi uh, visit to the State of Israel, a very important triggering moment for him, he uh, solidified his role as a peacemaker and as a dove, something that we saw much more of throughout the 1980s. Uh, and then finally, in the late 80s, after the Jordanian option collapsed, and it collapsed because King Hussein in uh, 1988, in July of 88, decided to sever all of Jordan's administrative and legal ties except for the uh, holy sites, uh, the Muslim holy sites in Jerusalem. But uh, after that, Paris concluded that uh, Israel had no choice. If it wanted peace, it would have to deal directly with the PLO and with Yasser Arafat, who he always thought was a problematic uh, character, but felt that there was no choice here. And the last point I want to make concerns Perez's role as somebody who was able to do a lot of things despite his very severe political constraints. And I completely agree with Professor Ben Ami here uh, on, on the point that it doesn't really matter what position he had. He might have been number two. He might have been given an irrelevant role. Uh, he was able to, uh, to do quite a bit with his uh, constraints because he knew how to exploit opportunities. And I want to give two examples. The first, going back to France in the 1950s, here he, uh, he had to confront many, many obstacles, one of which was the Anglo-Saxon orientation in the Israeli foreign ministry, where they were less than enthusiastic about uh, Israel's relationship with France and certainly did not want him as somebody who was in the defense ministry to, do, to conduct Israeli uh, foreign, po uh, foreign policy. The Quai d'Orsay, which is the French counterpart, therefore the French foreign ministry was also not inclined to support Israel. They were dealing with problems in Algeria. And the last thing they wanted to do was to uh, provide Israel with the kinds of arms that Israel uh, was seeking. Uh, they did not want to exacerbate the tensions with the Arab world. And then there was the inherent instability of the French Fourth Republic. Governments fell, rose and fell almost on a, on a weekly, monthly, sometimes daily basis. And finally, opposition within Israel itself in the political circles and the, and the uh, scientific community, especially when it came to Ben-Gurion's vision that Perez was tasked with implementing of turning Israel into a nuclear state. And so he used very unorthodox methods in order to pursue these objectives. He bypassed, for example, both of the foreign ministries. He conducted secret diplomacy with his French defense counterparts. And he engaged in uh, very, very creative uh, diplomacy on his own. And in fact, he created his own kind of fiefdom in Paris. And uh, that led to considerable hostility uh, by some of his uh, foreign ministry counterparts. But Ben-Gurion, uh, as I said, his mentor, his boss, sided with him and gave him the authority in which to do so. And the second example 
uh, is the very last position that he had, which was the presidency. Now, traditionally, the president is a very ceremonial position in Israel. It's a symbolic figurehead. And uh, you don't do politics as president. You don't do diplomacy as president. And Perez was able, in his seven years as president, to transform this low-profile ceremonial position into a highly visible platform for leadership and diplomacy. He brought greater visibility to the presidency than any time in the past. He utilized it as an incubator for all sorts of innovative projects. And he really gave it a role as a check on the government. The government primarily, I'm, uh, I'm referring here primarily to the Netanyahu government, which was, of course, more hawkish. He even got Netanyahu to agree to have him talk secretly conduct negotiations with uh, Abu Mazen, with Mahmoud, President Abbas, uh, in uh, 2011. And according to Perez, uh, and I'm sure more will be written on this in the, in the years ahead, according to Perez, he all but reached an agreement with Abbas uh, after four or five rounds of negotiations. And uh, he was going to, uh, uh, during their last meeting, he was going to finalize some of the details of this agreement and Netanyahu put the kibosh on the talks, torpedoed it. And again, this is, I just want to emphasize, this is Perez's version. This may not, you know, we, we will know more about this in uh, uh, hopefully the near future. Uh, and I want to close with just saying that, you know, what, what this tells me as, a, as an academic and as somebody who deals with uh, the constant struggle between agency and structure, you know, what is really the greatest uh, explanatory factor for major political outcomes uh, here, Perez is really a great example of somebody who shows that creative leadership, a creative approach, can really lead to a lot of big things, even when facing constraints. And Perez liked to say that when he was confronted with two unattractive ideas or two un unattractive options, he would always try to think of a third option, a third alternative that nobody else was able to see. And so Perez uh, often gets uh, criticized or credited with being this naive peacemaker, this naive optimist, and he was an optimist, and he was a peacemaker, but at the end of the day, I agree that he was a realist, and he was somebody who created opportunities to promote Israel's interests within the, uh, even when the options seemed quite bleak. Thank you.